Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. You're listening to a reading group episode of the show, which means that in this episode, I discuss the paper Freedom of the Will and the Concept of a Person by Harry Frankfurt from 1971 with two non-philosopher friends, Adam and Giffen, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. So this is uh, part six of the Moral Responsibility and Free Will series, where we discuss the aforementioned paper by Harry Frankfurt. This is just, it's it's a very, very fun paper. Um, Frankfurt talks about, uh, he introduces this term, uh, first and second order desires and second order volitions, and he talks about what these conceptually mean for freedom and responsibility, but also just as the title implies, the concept of what it means to be a person. So, I think this is one of the most classic papers in the responsibility debate. It's one of the most classic papers in all of philosophy. It's it's really, really fun, and I enjoyed the discussion very, very much. So I hope you enjoy listening to it as well. And with that introduction, here is our discussion. I I liked this paper. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a fun paper, I'd say. That's exactly what I was going to say. Very yeah. fun. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and it is an incredibly, I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but like it's an incredibly influential paper. It has like over 5,000 citations. I, I, I don't know whether it was just because, um, you know, I, I had just finished the paper, but I, I was kind of beginning to side with him a little bit on his framing of moral responsibility at the end there. Um, so I don't know how much he actually says about that. <laughs> Like about moral response, we should we'll, we should save it until the end. Yeah, let's go through it naturally. This paper was a little bit of a roller coaster. It was. You know what was funny, Adam? Um, I, uh, this is the same Harry Frankfurt that wrote on bullshit. It's the same guy. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. yeah. Um, and and knowing that <laughs> as I was reading it, um, I actually see I could see a lot of parallels in the way he argues. Um, between this and the on bullshit. I mean, this is a more technical paper than on bullshit. That was more of a just kind of a, a fun kind of conceptual analysis paper, but there's a lot of parallels in it. Um, you know what's interesting though? I, I if I were plan if I had planned out you know this series better, I actually might have had us do a different paper by him first in 1968 or 1969. I can't remember. He wrote a paper called um, oh, it's 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 something about alternative possibilities uh about a conception of free will and i i honestly don't recall how much this builds off of that or not um but that paper is incredibly short might be an interesting one to like maybe me check out and see if we want to follow up on um but so yeah so so um the paper title is freedom of the will and the concept of a person and um and he, I, I like the way that he kind of frames the discussion too, because he 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 doesn't start out in the kind of typical dry way of just saying like, well, we need a tighter conceptual analysis of what it means to have a free will, and I'm going to endorse like a compatibilist notion of it. You know, he he talks about what it actually means to be a person as differentiated from an animal, um, and he says that you know a lot of the time when we just like differentiate. Uh, persons from animals we talk about physical characteristics and psychological properties uh, but he says it's it's more than that um, there's there's more than that in in what we actually want to call a person and what we what we don't um, on page six uh, second paragraph he has this great quote he says there's a sense in which the word person is merely the singular form of people and in which both terms connotate no more than membership in certain biological species in those senses of the word which are of greater philosophical interest however the criteria for being a person do not uh, serve primarily to distinguish the members of our own species from the members of other species rather they are designed to capture those attributes which are subject of our most humane concern with ourselves which I, I liked uh, the kind of the way of framing it there. Um, so he says it's a, like it's his. He, he has like a. He actually kind of has like a very slow build to this. Like it takes a couple of pages for him to really get into like what he's going to talk about, um, which is funny given that it's not a very long paper in the first place. Um, but he says he says that you know there's an essential difference between people and. Uh, non-human creatures found in the structure of a person's will. 
He says human beings are not alone in having desires and motives or in making choices, but it seems peculiarly characteristic of humans that they are able to form what he calls second order desires or desires of the second order. Um, and I, so I like this paper a lot, but I, I, I actually have some notes in places. Like I found myself having to revisit definitions just to make sure I was keeping things conceptually straight in my head. Um, but so he, so he's just introduced what I think is his first kind of term, which is like a second order desire. Uh, and he says, you know, besides wanting and choosing and being moved to do this or that, men, he, this, he's writing in the 70s, so it's like it's men throughout the paper. It's not very progressive. Um, but he says men may also want to have or not to have certain desires and motives. So that's his definition of a second order desire um, is whether or not you want to have a desire or not. So uh, like an example of this is uh, it, it's less relevant now, but like back when I was like, you know, just kind of, you know, um, socially drinking more like, you know, sometimes when we would do a podcast, I would want to have a drink during it, you know, just to kind of kick back, relax. Then there's the question of, so I can have the desire to have a drink or not, um, but then you can step back and ask, do I want to desire a drink or not? And so that's the difference between like a first order and a second order desire on his account. Um, so then, then he kind of brings up the concept of a will, which is different from either of those two things. And he, he brings it up on page eight in the, in the PDF. I'll, I'll post it for people. Um, uh, third paragraph, he says, to identify with an agent's will is either to identify the desire or desires by which he is motivated in some action he performs or to identify the desire or desires by which he will or would be motivated when or if he acts. An agent's will then is identical with one or more of his first order desires. <clears throat> so he says, um, Rather, it's the notion of an effective desire, one that moves or will or would have moved a person all the way to action. So the will is basically, as I'm understanding him there, it's the, it's the effective desire, meaning kind of, for lack of a better term, the most powerful one, the one that actually initiates action or would initiate action. Um, and so that, that is what constitutes the will. Uh, so, so there's multiple desires and the one that is, is effective is the will. <clears throat> um, and so, th th so, so then he, he talks about there's two, there's two kinds of situations. Um, he says there's two kinds of situations in which it may be true that A wants to do X or wants to X. So A being an agent and X being an action. Um, and he says... In the first place, <clears throat> it might be true of A that he wants to have a desire to X, despite the fact that he has a univocal desire, although free of conflict and ambivalence, to refrain from Xing. Uh, someone might want to have a certain desire, in other words, but univocally want that desire to be unsatisfied, um, which is interesting. And he gives, I, I liked the example that he gave of it. Um, actually, there's, there's like a Black Mirror episode that kind of takes this and, and um, makes it uh, technologically relevant. Have you guys ever seen that episode? Um, it's no. a good, yeah, Adam, it's, I don't remember the name of it or anything, but it's that doctor. He has that kind of neural link thing. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's a great episode. Yeah. Um, I will, I, cause I know that Charlie Brooker, uh, Charlie Booker, I can't remember if it's Booker or Brooker uh, who makes that show. He has like a philosophy background. I wonder if they actually got that explicitly from this paper. That'd be very cool if they did. Um, good episode though. <clears throat> we could do that as a, as a, um, an episode of this for sure. But, uh, so he, he has like the example of a, of a, a physician who wants to experience what it's like to be addicted, uh, to something. And, uh, and he's, you know, he's, he's, he wants to have the desire to take a drug. He wants to feel what it's like to be addicted, but he doesn't want uh, that desire to be effective. He doesn't have the will to do a drug, um, but he 
he wants he's okay with having the desire to do it um he he does not want this desire to be effective he doesn't frankfurt says he may not want it to move him all the way to action which is interesting um and he says <clears throat> it it would thus be incorrect to infer from the fact that the physician now wants to desire to take the drug that he already does desire to take it. Um, it would thus be incorrect to infer from the fact that the physician now wants, wants the desire to take the drug that he already does desire to take it. Oh, I guess he's just, he's just saying that like there's, there's a potentiality to it. Um, oh, oh yeah, no, I, I get what he's saying. He, I think he's saying there that like, you, you don't have to already have a desire in order to want to have that desire. Right. I, I think that's what he's saying there. Yeah. Like we so can, we the can condition be, of having the second order desire, but not the first order desire. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. It's the, it, yeah, it would be like the condition of, of like potentially wanting something or, or, or wanting to have that desire. Um, even though you don't currently have it, which, which makes sense to me. Like I, I find that that psychologically is, is pretty tight conceptually. Um, so, so that's the first type is where there's an unfulfilled desire for X. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a second kind of situation that may be described by a wants to want to X. Um, so this is where the first and second order desires align, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and he says, then it does pertain to what A wants his will to be. In such cases, the statement means that A wants the desire to X to be the desire that moves him effectively to act. It is not merely that he wants to desire X. He wants the desire to X to be among the desires by which to one or agree to another. He is moved or inclined to act. Um, so moves him effectively to act so, so this is this is the one where i mean right am i getting this right that this is where his will is endorsing the first order desire right this this is where his first and second order desires align so there's a case in which they don't align and there's a case in which they do right yeah it would be but he differentiates between desire and will though right will i mean does, uh will is synonymous with first order desires no, will is synonymous with the effective desire, right? Which is, but what did he say up here? He said, um, what, what page? Let's see, it might have been. I think it was eight or nine here. A middle third paragraph of eight. He he says to identify an agent's will is to is either to identify the desire or the desires by which he is motivated in some action he performs, or to identify the desire by which he will or would be motivated when he acts. Um, an agent's will then is that, identical with one or more of his first order desires. But it has to be effective, right? Correct. But okay. I, I I think I think just for the sake of the conversation, though, you conflated desire and will there. When so, yep, yep, they're different. They're different. Um, because yes, so so the will is the effective first order desire, um, and then there are desires of both the first and the second order kind. Yes, <clears throat> and and the first and the first case he laid out is where those two desires align or don't align, and then the second case is one in which they do. Right. Yes. So that's that's the framework. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um. And, and okay, uh, if it is, I, I don't know exactly what this quote says, so I'm just going to read it out loud. If it is some other desire that actually moves him when he acts, on the other hand, then what he wants at that time is not in the relevant sense what he wants to want. Okay, so that's just clarifying that if it's actually some other desire that is synonymous with his will, then he was just mistaken about uh, what he wants to want in that case. Um, where, so, where is where is that exactly? I want I want to read that one again. There. Yeah, it's um, the last paragraph before section two. Uh, the last, the second to last sentence. I'll, I'll read it again. Okay. <clears throat> if it is some other desire that actually moves him when he acts, on the other hand, then what he wants at that time is not in the relevant sense what he wants to want. Um, is that I feel like true? we might need is to go it, back? Yeah. Earlier. Yeah. 
Is that is that true? Because I'm wondering. Well, well this is so. This is this is under. This is when he's discussing in the the second case where A uh, has a desire to do X, um, and and that's effective and it's endorsed by him. Uh, and I think Frankfurt. Am I right? Is he just saying in that sentence that if it's some other desire that actually moves him, then what he wants at that time is not what he wants to want. Um, yeah, so, that, so that's just saying, so, so if it's actually something else that's motivating him, then it's, a, then it's the case one, right, where the, the, the first and second order desires don't align. Right? So, so I think he's, he's, being, he's saying that like, you can kind of be mistaken about what you think will be your effective desire, but if it is something else that, that is effective, then, and it's not what you wanted to want, then we're just back in the first case of where your first and second order desires don't align. I think it all predicates <clears throat> on if you assume this is true, you've got to assume the want is how we defined it earlier. It has to be the effective desire. Yeah, it has yeah. to be effective. It has to be effective. Yeah, this last yeah. paragraph was doing exactly that. It was just saying just because you have the second order desire and the desire does not mean you like are quite there yes. yet. Yes. So it's yeah. like, so I can I can have the desire to have a drink while we do a podcast. And I can either want to have that desire or I could not want to have that desire. And if I have a drink, that is the effective desire, i.e. my will. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so th that's, that's the definitional or conceptual framework that he sets up in section one. Um, I think he took kind of a long time to do it, but it was actually, it was, it was good, especially with the rereading parts. Like if you wanted to reread it, it was very rereadable. Um, because I, I, I know I definitely did a bit of that um, through this. So, okay. So then he goes into section two. Um, excuse me. And he says, someone has a desire of the second order, either when he wants simply to have a certain desire or when he wants a certain desire to be his will. So, okay, that, that he's just, he's just, I think he's, he's flushing out more the concept of a second order desire, right? Um, he says, in situations of the latter kind, I shall call this his second order, I shall call his second order desires second order volitions or volitions of the second order. So second order volitions are when he wants a certain desire to be his will. He wants, he, when you want a certain desire to be effective, uh, that is a second order volition. Um, and it has to be the one that's a, it has to be the one that you want yourself to do at that point. Um, he says, um, yeah, he says, uh, now it is having second order volitions and not having second order desires generally that I regard as essential to being a person. So he's saying there's a difference in effectiveness here. It's like you can have second order desires to want to want something but in order to be a person you also have to have second order volitions you want to have certain desires be effective in moving you or not i'm understanding that correctly right yeah <laughs> okay okay um so he says it is oh this this is where he introduces the concept of the wanton um so he says it is logically possible however unlikely that there should be an agent with second order desires, but with no volitions of the second order. Such a creature, in my view, would not be a person. I shall use the term wanton to refer to agents who have first order desires, but who are not persons, because whether or not they have desires of the second order, they will have no second order volitions. So in, in layman's terminology, this would be a type of person who... Uh, has these second order desires so he has desires clearly like he's pulled towards different things in the world and he has second order desires about what he wants to want but he doesn't have second order volitions where he wants certain desires and not others to be effective and this is what frankfurt calls the wanton um <laughs> which is like it's a very inadvertently funny concept like i i found myself kind of like you know smirking at this um, ripe for humor like, what do you guys, what do you, I mean, do, I, I like this concept of a wanton, um, because 
I don't think there's ever there's probably never been a person. Well, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's there's probably never been like a true wanton in like uh, you know the deepest sense 100 percent of the time. But I like this idea as elucidating kind of different types of persons almost, you know, or at least different types of persons it, like you, you could have like like I think there are times where I am more wanton than others, you know. Wantonly, I believe, is how he he uses it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says, the essential characteristic of a wanton is that he does not care about his will. Remember the, the effect of first order desire. Um, his desires move him to do certain things without its being true of him, either that he wants to be moved by those desires or that he prefers, prefers to be moved by other desires. Adam, this is where I was thinking of on bullshit. Remember where he says bull bullshitting is neither telling the truth nor conforming to the expectations of a lie. I, I, saw, yeah. like a, I saw like a parallel here where like a wanton is not, um, is not having the, the second order volition to have effective, to have certain desires be effective. But he's also like, he, there's no positive or negative direction of a wanton. He's just doing, he's just acting on desires, right? Like he's not positively or negatively endorsing them. Um, and yeah, he says in any case, uh, adult humans may be more or less wanton. They may act wantonly, <laughs> which is, which is funny. Um, like, I don't know. Do, do you guys like, did this, did this psychologically connect with you at all? Like there, I feel like there are definitely times in my life with like certain kind of areas of my life where I do act more wantonly than others, you know, just kind of driven from behind in some sense. See, for me, it wasn't quite as intuitive. Well, he introduces the wanton specifically when explaining the possibility of having second order desires, but not second order volitions, which is yeah. very kind of like specific difference. So it, was, it took me a little bit to conceptualize like what that might be. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and he does introduce the caveat <clears throat> that, like, you know, it may be unlikely. Um, so it, it took me a little bit to, like, fully grasp, like, someone who would <clears throat> want to want something. Yeah. But not want that something to be driving it, towards action, you know? Like, it, it, it's yeah. very hard to get in that framework of a wanton. It is. It is. Have you ever, like, um, have you ever kind of rationalized yourself into, like, certain things, though? Like, you know, like... Um... I, I'm trying to think of just kind of a, a recent example of my, this is actually not recent. Um, <clears throat> cause I've been more focused on, uh, kind of like health and, and diet and exercise recently, but like previously, especially, you know what, this was especially true in school. Um, when, when I was in college, I would have the desire to kind of binge on certain things, whether it was like, you know, alcohol or just kind of like shitty food sometimes, you know what I mean? And I feel like I would have that desire and I kind of wantonly wanted to have that desire almost. And, and it was like, I, I, I feel as though there were certain times in my life with certain things where I actually didn't deliberate about which I wanted to be effective or not. Like those are like, those are more dark moments, like for any, for any human. Cause like, it's, he, I mean, he's right. Like it's very subhuman of us almost like, <laughs> You're just kind of doing things, you know, um, and you can have these kind of I almost imagine them as like like the second order desires almost seem epiphenomenal. Like they must seem like like um, they just arise because the first order desires are being done. You know, um, like you, you like you find yourself just kind of I don't know, like may, maybe it's easier, actually, if we don't think about it personally. But like I know that like. I, haven't you guys seen this in other people? Like, this is so easy to see in other people. Like, acting wantonly. You're like, come on. You're like, you know, like, what example are you thinking of, Adam? Maybe a novel, is it? I, I mean, I'm not, like, not like a specific example. I, I can think of one, but I mean, you're yeah. right. Like, it is, it is easier to see in other people. Like, this shit, this <laughs> shit, it's really easy to see in other people. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Yeah. So, like, like if someone, like, okay, I, I had a friend, I had a friend in college, um, I had a friend, well, he's still my friend, but like I'm thinking about him in college. Um, and like he was definitely heavier than he should have been, you know? Um, and well, that's true of almost anyone at like a certain point in time, you know, like, like heavier than I should be now. But like, but you know, it was like, it was like he, he definitely could have lost some weight. And 
it was like, I, you know, I kind of know, like, it was like, you know, you're doing a bit of projecting, you're doing a bit of like theory of mind, theoretic, um, theorizing with this, but like, it, it almost appeared to me as though he had this desire to kind of, um, to, to eat poorly. And he, he had the desire to not work out or he didn't have the desire to work out. And it was almost like he wanted to have those desires, or at the very least, he didn't have a problem with having those desires. But there was no second order volition. You know what I mean? He wasn't like, yeah, I want the desire to, I want the desire to have sweets be effective. Like there wasn't that. I don't know. Do, do you know what I'm kind of? I, I, I think it's yeah. easier to like conceptualize it in cases where like cases you just mentioned right there, where it's like someone is almost. Um, you know, they, they feel almost blasé toward first order desires yeah. rather, rather than like, you know, um, you know, having, you know, they're a, not I, fighting it. Yeah. I, I, it's hard to conceptualize a second order desire that isn't a second order volition per se. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, cause I, case. Yeah. you know what I mean? It's because hard, I, I, yeah. I think more, it's easier, it's much easier to kind of just, um, you know, the just lack of a second order desires. Easier. Yeah, yeah. 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 The difference is what would really like grab, like was difficult for me conceptually. Like it's really hard to find a case where, especially in, I mean, maybe more or less than others is hard to say because it involves like, you know, yeah. their, their, their want of effectiveness. <laughs> yes. I, I, so I feel like it is overwhelmingly like if we're thinking about cases in which, the person is kind of acting wantonly. I feel like the vast majority of those cases are cases in which they just, they, they, at least they don't uh, have a strong second order desire to, to not do something right. Like it's kind of like you're, it, maybe it's like, like you don't have a, you, you don't have a second order desire to continue to gain weight but you certainly don't have a second order volition to lose weight or like to, to be motivated to do the things to lose weight. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You seem almost there. There's no second order concern whatsoever yeah. to, 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 you know, to first order desires. It's, it's so. like a lack of critical reflection almost. It's like, it's yeah. not that you've, I, I feel like, I, and this is where I guess I disagree a little bit, but I, I guess I don't know if I disagree or not, but like, I, I almost find that these cases are more often brought out by a lack of reflection, like a lack of, of actually cognitive recognition than an in, a positive endorsement of something. So in this case, is lack of like recognition or reflection indicative of a lack of a second order desire? Or can that still be there in the way you just described? Well, it's for sure a lack of a negative a strong negative second order desire, right? right. Like I, I really do not want to want to do this. Yeah, like I really hate that I want a donut. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, because, yeah, I don't know. So, like, what what's an example? Like, I'm like I'm just trying to think of. So, what's an example where you have a second order desire, and it aligns with the first order desire? But it's not a second order volition, because I because I feel like I feel like um, I feel like he's not wrong with this. But I'm 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 having a harder time coming up with examples because it's so it, it's almost paradoxical. But but I kind of do think people are inconsistent in their own minds like this. Do you know what I mean? Um, like let's oh, like like um yeah like honestly I, I did struggle with trying to think of a second order desire but not a second order volition kind of case like it was it was difficult here you know what here's one here's one maybe sure. okay so so let's let so uh, what about what about someone who has oh it's like it's like okay let's think of someone who has kind of like larger career goals right sure um but but they're they're um. But they're doing like the, like a waitress or something. Like they're doing this part this part time job right now, kind of like before that point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have the desire to make that money, right? Like they want the money, and then they have the second order desire. They want to want that money, right? <sighs> I'm getting lost in the example, but they're not. 
They don't have the second order of volition for that desire to be effective. They, they actually don't like so. So to work that short term job as opposed to really roughing it or something like to, to get to that further career stage or something like is that because it seems like they have the first order desire and they have the second order desire, but they don't have the second order volition there. I'm curious if this is a case where, like, we're talking about, like, two separate things. It's, like, the the desire yeah. for the money versus, like, the desire to for, to work, right? It's, like, obviously related, but... Yeah, like, it, like, yeah. I'm honestly, like, I mean, the, the details of the, the, the details of the example were shitty. Um, I don't think they were bad. Like, I'm actually like, better than what I could think of. You know, no, no, no. Let me, let me refine it. Let me refine it. Yeah. Um, let me think about this. So, so how about this? So they, so they let's, let's use, use the same person. Sure. So they're getting job, they're getting money from their kind of temporary job now, mm -hmm. um, and and they they kind of have like they they could be their plan was to save this to then put into like, you know, uh, the time off that it takes to like apply to these jobs or like they're starting their own business or something, right? Yeah. Um, and and. Um, <clears throat> They're oh I've got it I've got it so they're buying things they're like spending money on frivolous things now right so like they're buying a brand new TV or something so they have the desire for the TV and let's say that they actually endorse that desire so they have the second order desire so like so they're thinking I want this TV and I'm okay with wanting this like I want to want this TV mm -hmm. but they don't have the second order volition for that desire for the TV to be effective over the desire excuse me, to save that money or something like that. Huh, that actually is interesting because it actually does seem useful to introduce like two separate desires to explain like the effectiveness being like different. Yeah, right? I, I, feel like, I feel like we're almost moving into like the third order of desires by doing that, right? I don't think, right? Aren't, aren't you, because you're like comparing so like the person wants to want to buy that tv right yeah that's yeah. two sure but then do they want to want to want to buy that tv <laughs> and i don't well but i guess it's like, 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 no like, like, because like the third order desire would be there for the other case because it was effective is that what you're getting but, is, but isn't that the difference between a, a second order desire and a second order volition that can account for that discord without the third level being brought in right i'm curious if that's his definition though if like no, the I, third order I, desire... i'm i'm just not following <laughs> Honestly, like, like I, that, it, just, it just sounds like you're pushing it one further back where it's like, OK, you know, they, they have like a greater goal, mm -hmm. you know, like in mind. But so then they would have to then kind of like examine, you know, like a further desire kind of pushed back, like between like, do, do they want to want to buy that, you know, want to want to want to buy that TV. So I yeah, I guess I I don't think that it has to be conceptualized like that. But so so are you are you trying to um, are you saying there's no robust conceptual distinction between a second order desire and a second order volition? I, I no, it's just that he's saying it's logically possible, however unlikely. And yeah. I honestly didn't follow the example you gave. Like I, I didn't, I didn't understand how really? that actually. I, I didn't understand how that met the criteria. Yeah. I thought that. I mean, that kind of was useful to me. Rephrase, I'm not 100%. Re rephrase it then for me, Giffen, because I, I wasn't following that. <laughs> ah, okay. So the condition where we're trying to like bring to light here is where someone has a second order desire, but not a second order volition. The difference being based on like whether they want it to be effective, right? Okay. Yeah. So in this case. The person is saving money, right, for, like, goals related to investment, right, in themselves or whatever, okay? Um, so they see it, they walk by the store, they see a TV, they want the TV, and they, like, reflect, and they're like, I kind of want to want the TV, like, the TV is, like, useful, it's like, I, I could do a lot with it, I would be enjoyable. You know how there's, like, there's some people who are frugal, and they're like, no, like, what are you doing? And then there's other people who are like, yeah, treat yourself, or whatever, you know, what I mean? like, there's that kind of, like, there's, there's two, like, sets of mind yeah. to those, yeah. Almost like, almost like, the, you, like, I want to want it, because, like, they know it would be good for their mental health or something, even. Well, like, I don't think, well, I don't think you need to specify the because. That's right? what you don't like, need to just, specify. Yeah, it's just you want to want, want it. it. 
Yes, that's true. I was trying to add some context. To I see just it. wanted to keep it parsimonious. <laughs> yeah. So they want to want the TV, um, but they're, um, w- I guess in this case, this is like their want to want to save is actually effective. If they so there's like a conflict that, between so, the second yeah. order desires here of saving and buying. TV. So like Adam, Adam, there's I'm I'm almost kind of visualizing it here. So there's like all of these. There's this myriad of first order desires that we're all kind of buffeted by, right? Um, and all of those are connected, at least potentially, to second order desires or like the I'm okay with having these first order desires, right? Um, but then. The ones that almost get highlighted out of the larger group are the second order volitions, the ones that you want to be effective. So you're, it's almost like I'm really weirdly kind of like anthropomorphizing it, but you're almost like you're almost like there are all of these kind of ones and you're picking which ones you want to be effective. Does that I, I don't know. Am I thinking about that in like a weird way or? Like Adam, I guess mm-hmm. I, I don't understand. Are you, because um, if if you're not trying to argue for the collapsing the distinction between a second order desire and a second order volition, can you give me an example of one then that like makes more sense to you? No, I actually just don't really see the distinction too much here. Like okay. it's kind it's okay. kind of hard for me to like imagine how you could want to want something, but it's also you you wouldn't want it to be an effective first order desire. I, have, I like. I, I have think an example from another philo- philosopher actually on this. Um, okay. I, I can some... I say just if you have one thing before you, the other philosopher comes in because I think that might be useful. I'm just imagining the only case that I'm kind of really like grasping this is one in which there is actually a conflict between two like second order desires. Right, the first desire is there in both cases. The second desire is there in both cases. But one will be effective and the other one won't be. Like you but, can't... But, the, but, but that's when he introduces the third, third order desire at that point then. That's that's the paragraph in which he introduces the third order desire when there's a conflict. At the very between... end? No, it's like may, maybe maybe like a two or three pages from now. Maybe that's nearing the end. But it's about halfway through. But that's when he introduces like the third order desires when there's a conflict between second order desires. And one wins out? Um, uh, but I, I did not think that he... Yeah, because it doesn't need to be the case that there's like a conflict for there to be the sec- or the higher order desire. Yeah, Adam, I, I, I didn't think that third order desires got... Really? Yeah, can we, can we, were, we, can we, can we yeah, go to that go. section? Let's, I remember let's it being that? like, in theory, you could go higher It's on page 16, it. right? Um, he yeah. says there is no theoretical limit. To the length of the well, series. Well, hang on. Of, I, 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 oh. I, think, I think you just skipped the part that was relevant to what I was. I mean, well, he I only could introduces be, third order desires, I think, in page 16, Jordan's saying. I don't know where it is before that. Okay. Another complexity is that a person may have, especially if his second order desires, desires are in conflict, desires and volitions of a higher order than the second. Mm-hmm. That's, that's exactly what Given just said. There is yeah, no so theoretical the before. Yeah, yeah, but but you skip that sentence. So I'm saying like that's where he introduces like you know a conflict of second order desires to introduce mm-hmm. like a third order desire, you know, of like you know wanting you know wanting to want Ooh, want to you want. know like it's, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's like you know you've you've pushed it back another. Actually, so, so Adam, so now I don't know if this is exactly what you're getting at or not, but I'm like reading this and it's like. Is there a case where there are not two conflicting second order desires um, where there is like the second order desire, but not a second order volition? Is that what you're is that like a useful question? So the case we brought up there, which I thought Jordan like brought up, which was interesting, um, where you have the second order desire, but not the second order volition is one in which two second order desires are in conflict. Is it necessary for is like is it possible for there to not be a conflict in the second order desires and still have like second order desire but not volition? Does that make sense? Or am I off the rails here? No, no, it makes sense. I mean, I I just don't know. It's it's just like the cases we brought up have like <laughs> seemed more like third order desire cases to me. Yeah, like I'm curious. Can a, like can a, would, a, oh, Jordan, would a would a third order desire merely merely be the one? that directs what you want to be your second order of volition like is that all a third like that that's yeah, is what there like a logical tie 
was like, is your third order desire what determines which of the myriad of second order desires becomes the second order volition? Okay, I get, I get, I get what you're saying there now. I yeah. wonder if he would agree. Yeah, with that. I don't know. Would, would he agree with that or not? Like, I don't. Know. Hard to say. I it seems well, like he introduces like the third order desire as like another complexity here. So it's like it's not necessary to explore to explain like the no like volition, which I'm makes me lean like no, he wouldn't agree that that's like the you know synonymous, I guess. Well, I don't think they have to be synonymous for them to be. Would a would a third action or a third order desire merely be that thing oh. that determines? what of your second order desires becomes your second order volition. Well, right. seems... I guess the, the question would be then, like, to rephrase it, like, is it possible to have, like, a second order volition without a third order desire? Or is uh, it, like, logically, like, linked like I, that? I don't know if conceptually that adds anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, 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 because then you have to ask what determines which second order desire becomes the second order volition. And then it's like, well, you can just say that it happens on that level. Or you can say that that's just what a third order desire is. And I don't know. Like, I'm not sure if there's an important distinction between the two. I, I don't know. I mean, like, I think, it, I think it makes more sense to have a third level. Like, you, you, it's like, it's like wanting... <sighs> it's going to get complicated as an example. But like, it is. Um, it's like, so I have a desire, and then I can endorse that desire. Mm -hmm. But then I can want to be the type of person that endorses that desire or not. Right. Right? It's something like that. Um, right? Yeah. I, no, I, I, that, I, that, that sounds like three levels and explained well because you use three different verbs. I, yeah, yeah. That, honestly, it's, it's, a problem, to, though, it's a problem of verbiage. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Um, but like, right, so, so would it, so is it, I think it's okay. I, I don't think we're kind of bastardizing his framework here to say that what turns a second order desire into a second order volition is just a third order desire. Like that's, I mean, it has to be kind of that logically. Like that's what a hierarchical will would look like, right? Well, that's the thing. It's like, I'm not sure if he would. And I only say that because he says like, it's another complexity but that's not really fully relevant. Yeah. Like, that's what it seems like to me. So I'm not sure if he would endorse like, <sighs> yes, Third but I desires. just I just don't know if he really cares that much about it. Like like I don't know if he kind of brushes it away because he doesn't care or because it's too complicated for the paper. Do you know what I mean? True. I don't. I, know. I, I I I think that he's okay with my conceptualization of it. Okay. I would think that. I don't know, Adam. Would because this was your question. What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I still fully buy it. Um, just because like you don't I buy don't... it, he would agree, or you don't buy it in general. I well, I, I, I good question because I mean <laughs> I, maybe spell out what I refers to <laughs> exactly. I mean we're, we're speaking in like three tiers at this point. Um, I I I I buy the like tiered desires, no problem. Yeah, but I'm not sure. Like, I I still have like an issue with like effective versus non-effective second order desires i think i know your concern i think i wrote it down, like actually it, like what does it mean for someone to want to have a desire but it not to be effective like is that incoherent you're asking almost i i i am i'm almost kind of at that point where it's like so yeah. it, and it, it's i so i wrote um, that question down and i found a potential answer to it okay we'll bring it up now because it's I, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, it's, I actually yeah. wrote down the question verbatim is, why would someone ever want a first order desire that they didn't want to be effective? What's an example of this? Because, because like I, I had that very same thought. Um, because like so, so here's this is an example brought up by um, Tamler Summers from the University of Houston. Um, he he it brings up the example of kind of like an older gentleman in the office who has the desires to like you know fuck these younger women around him right but he he's he's he has he wants to want that desire because let's say you know it keeps him young it keeps it like you know kind of energetic at work like there's a bit of like flirtation in his mind right but he doesn't want that desire to be effective because um you know he has a wife or something right he doesn't want to be uh, he doesn't want to ha have infidelity in the relationship um or he doesn't want to put his job at jeopardy but he's actually okay with having that desire, 
he just doesn't want it to be effective, which is to say he has a second order desire. He wants to want to fuck the women in his office, but he doesn't want it to be a second order volition. And maybe that's determined by the third order desire to not have, like it's all, those kind of concerns are pushed into like the third order desire to keep a stable life or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's kind of operating up in there. Okay, so I, I think I, I think I can buy that now. I mean, even like, because I, I, the thing is like, even though I don't really buy the premise, um, mm. I mean, like he says, like, is it logically possible? It's yes. conceptually. Yes, yes, yes. 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 What, like, what, even, what even don't you makes, buy then? Because it makes no absolute sense, like that someone would like want to want to fuck the women, the younger women in the office, but not. It, there's Why they would don't you want to not want to have that desire. It, it, exactly, yeah. it, it's like they, they they it's a desire that they have that's a first order desire, right? It's also yeah. they want to want to fuck the women. They're okay with having that desire. Yeah, yeah, but they but, the desire. But, but they don't want it to be effective. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I, it's ridiculous. I agree with you. I it's had this ridiculous. very same concern. Like, do I have, like, I was asking myself, Adam, this very same question. Do I have any examples of this in my life? And it's like, I don't think I do. See, I, I almost am coming around to the point that it does make sense. Like, I don't think it's absurd. Is there anything in your life that you, yeah, I would that love you to want, hear. that you want to want, but that you don't want to be effective? <laughs> that, that's tough for me to, like, think of myself. Um, did I don't know? Honestly, it was like Jordan's explanations of the the old coworker case, as well as like the the <laughs> was um, a part time worker <laughs> gentleman, um, <laughs> as well as like the um, part time worker case that I think made started to make sense to me. And it makes sense specifically when there's a conflict in second order desires. Then, like that, when there's a case where there's a conflict of second order desires, it actually does make sense. That like you would have the second order desire, but not want it to be effective because you have a stronger second order desire. That's like the case else. where it makes sense to me. Here's, or it's determined by a third order desire. Well, you mean. Yeah, that may or may not be synonymous. But here's, yeah. here's, here's, I think that it's conceptually very possible. And I think it is an actuality. Like there has to be an old man who, who like, in, like has those views, right? Like that guy has, has to yeah. exist. He, um, he wants... I, to fuck the women he wants to want to fuck the women he endorses it because like he thinks it's like a positive trait to like you know be live it keeps him young or whatever exactly. like that, that was the example that like yeah. summers used so there, oh. it, it is an explanation for the second order desire but then but the he egg... doesn't want it to be effective because of other competing second, second order, order desires desire. but adam i so while i'm saying that i'm i'm questioning whether that is deeply irrational or not and coming down on the side of yes it's deeply irrational you think so? Yeah, but 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 it's logically consistent. Like but, yes, yeah, yeah. But so I, I I'm fully on board with that now. But it, it's <laughs> it's an absolutely ridiculous case. But well, so so uh, I actually because, don't think it's irrational. Can I explain yeah. why I, I might think yeah. of this? Mm. So I contend that you. So let's take let's take the case of the old man at the office, the older gentleman, <laughs> the more lively case. I I I am deeply. So, like, I guess I, I understand the reasons why we might want to say that it's rational, but I don't think that those are very good reasons. Um, because, like, you know, he's like, it keeps, I, I think, shit, I had it, I had it phrased perfectly. Um, I think that he, I've lost it at this point. I think that he, why wouldn't he, if you have a, if you have a desire that you don't want to be effective, there is like the natural question is why the hell wouldn't you just like want that desire to go away? Like, why don't you, like, why wouldn't you only want desires? And I guess I'm thinking like he could endorse that. Like it's, it's good willpower. Like it's a good exercise of willpower. Like it makes him a more disciplined person. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe like, uh, uh, but, but like to me, it's I useful to any... imagine for me, like, it's useful to imagine the case where like, you know, he wants, so he wants it, he wants to want it, um, and like, but he doesn't want it to be effective so long as the other second order desire competes, but that second, the competing second order desire could always like go away, it could always change. Then it's, he's on with the women. Exactly. In his office. To me, yeah. I think to me is rational, right? Like, once the conflict goes ah. away, like, everything's lining up, right? 
So it's a change at the third order level then, basically. It seems to be the most... I think I've come around to the idea that... The, I think the, Adam's coming around a little bit. <laughs> you think it's rational, Adam? The old man's a rational machine? <laughs> I honestly don't know. Like, I... <laughs> like, I... I come I'm on. not... I'm, I'm, so, Adam, I mean, what about I, this? What about this, actually? So, okay. Ah, no, but this... Adam doesn't wants doesn't to understand, and he here's... wants to want to understand. <laughs> no, no, here's, here's the thing, Adam. I'm, I'm with you. I'm struggling to identify a case in my own life where I actually have this. Um... Because, like, let's just use a really kind of banal example. Like, I have the desire for just, you know, sugar and carbs, right? Like, it's donuts and shit, like cake, just just gross-ass food, you know? Like, I have the desire to that for that. I do not have the second-order desire to want to want that. Like, I don't want that desire. Um, and I sure as hell don't want it to be effective. Like, I, I don't – I sure as hell don't have a second-order volition. And so, like, I – I'm struggling to come up with a counter case to that. That's I, actually true of myself. I think I might have found something. Let's okay. see if we can parse this out. So here's where the situation I'm actually in, right? I ter- currently don't go to a gym. The only exercise yes. I do is like running yeah. whenever it's, the weather's nice. Um, just to keep myself floating, treading water. Mm. Um, I want to go to the gym. I, I enjoy it. Okay. I want to want to go to the gym. I'm on board. Clearly, right? <laughs> Straightforward so far. But I actually you, don't want you, that to be effective because I have some severely do. competing second order desires mm. regarding work. I have been very busy trying to publish like two different papers. Or you could use COVID, like COVID risk as an example. Yeah. That works too. Yeah. yeah. But you see how like I actually am not willing to change either the first order or the second order desire related to the gym. Yes. But like the competing second order desire is actually making me say, okay, I don't want that to be effective right now because like the third order desire is like i want to publish the paper more than i want to like you know get slightly more fit and, and that's, that's determined that's, by the third order desire this is the type of person or the type of life i want to have i want to be someone who endorses you know that specific second order desire yeah yeah it's like which 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 will or which desire do i want to be effective yeah yeah does that does that make a little more sense yeah, I think I think I'm happy now that we've introduced like the thir- third order desires into this. I, I think I think it can be explained with a higher level that it, it no longer becomes a second order volition. It becomes a second order desire because I, I think I follow wait, that. Wait. That's whoa. You mean reverse of that, right? Um. Well, it, it, no, it, no, no, because it, it would no longer be a second order volition. His desire to go to the gym. I mean, like oh, the second, oh, it, oh, it would, it would, it would, be, it would now be a second order desire. Yes, so, yes, yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just, the, I was always conceptualizing it as different. There's like multiple second order desires, and those get elevated to the volition or not. So we were just thinking about it in different terms. Yeah, but the point is, yeah, you can also it, demote yeah. Them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, I think, like, I think, rational, I, 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 I think the default though is definitely like. You know, it's effective. Like, unless there's like that's other the first com- order desire, right? No, no, no. It, it, it's it's we're talking about once once you include the word volition, you're talking about you want a first order desire to be effective, right? Yes. Yes. So you know, but once it gets demoted to oh, yeah. second order desire, like, yeah. it, I, I think I think like I the, don't have a lot of second order desires that aren't second order del- volitions. Yeah. Which, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't have I feel, a lot of those. I think yeah. you might have more than you think. Like, I mean, I can't speak for you, but I, I think it's non-zero, I guess. Like, sure, sure. Like, do you think the case that I brought up, like, made sense? Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, you can imagine, like, a lot Makes of aspects sense. of your life where, like, you're completely content being someone. I think it, I, that, I like that phrase. Like, you endorse being that type of person. Yeah. Right? But, like, you endorse being the other type of person a little bit more. Right. I think there were probably a decent amount of conflicts in the second order desires there. Um, yeah. It's hard to probably think about. No, no. You know what? I mean, that's fair, actually. Like, here's one for me, actually. Um, so, like, I enjoy, uh, like, restoring uh, the BMW that I have, right? Absolutely. And, like, I have the desire to, to restore it. And I want to do that. Like, I'm happy to endorse that. Yeah. But there are some times where I don't want that desire to be effective. I don't want it to become a second order volition um, because of other competing uh, desires and their second order desires, like right. applying to grad school. Like I need to focus on preparing for this conference instead of restoring the car. Right. And the yeah. podcast is a good example of a like 
very solid third tier desires. Like it overcomes everything else. All <laughs> second order desires. <laughs> it is the case. <laughs> Adam often trades it for second order volition to get food at eight thirty every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I didn't this Sunday. No, you you didn't have you you, you didn't have the second order of volition to do that this Sunday. Okay, <laughs> no. okay. So yeah. then, so the wanton then, if I so under our more developed understanding, the wanton would be someone who just walks around, kind of just living at the level of the first order then, um, because they have second order desires, but they don't. They basically don't have the power of a third order desire in order to select a second order volition. So they seem to just live at the first order, right? That sounds about right. Yeah, I, I can't. It like becomes almost illogical to me. Well, actually, it does become illogical right now to imagine that like he uh, who wrote the paper Frankfurt. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's. <laughs> well, this is kind of a this is a, a reductio of a person. Right, like this person probably hasn't existed, but like, well, yeah, it'd be curious to see if it would. But and this person would scarcely be human. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to imagine if Frankfurt would agree with our formulation of like including the third order desire in that definition. I, I really right? think we should be okay. I don't, I, I don't think I agree that, that we yeah. like. I think it makes sense this way. But I'm I just imagining, too. like, would Frankfurt imagine someone like? Like like, what else could a space. Th- but what else could a third order desire do as opposed to like select which second order desire becomes a volition? Like what else could it do? Like that seems to be the only thing it could exist for. So I, I, I really, I, I guess, I, I mean, yeah, I agree with I, you, but I'm not sure if he agrees because if, to me, if he I think like, endorsed that view, so we, <laughs> I mean, this is from the seventies. So it's very hard to like yeah. project so far backwards. Cause he was like, you know, you said this is one of the most cited papers in like the area. Huge so, I mean, if, if you're like charting the new path, it's really hard to like be too critical on him, right? But if he like thought of and included in the paper the idea of third order desires, but he didn't connect that to like second order volition, then like, that really like, that's disturbing to me, right? Like we just like yeah, talked about he's that kind like, of a writer oh. though. Like he is like Frankfurt is that kind of a writer. I he can't lets say you that some... for certainly. No. You can say that. With he lets you. I feel like he lets you make those connections, though. Um, so, so like, like, here, listen to this, though. Um, this was right after the quote that Adam read. It is possible, however, to terminate such a series of acts, acts being this, like, um, theoretical limit, or there's no theoretical limit, like there's second order, third order, fourth order, right? It is possible, however, to terminate such a series of acts without cutting it off arbitrarily. When a person identifies himself decisively with one of his first order desires, he, the, this commitment resounds throughout the potential endless array of the higher orders. So um, if you have, so like you, ha- you have all of these kind of competing first order desires, you want to do a bunch of shit, and you're okay with having some of those, but only one can be the second order volition. Um, and as soon as your third order desire determines which is the volition, then the three align and it's over. Like you don't have to retreat into fourth ones and fifth ones, right? Um, so I, I, if he's not okay with how we're conceptualizing it, then I'm, I would disagree. Because like I think we've conceptualized it very neatly. Yeah, that, that's honestly how I read that section too. That yes. it's just like, you know, if it all comes down to kind of competing second order desires. And if there, if there aren't competing second order desires, then it's a second order volition, you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. pretty much no like, contest there. Yeah. I, Cause I, I think, I mean, Giffen might disagree a little bit based on his facial expression, I, but I, I mean, do, I think I, but do you not, do not think that a second order desire is the default. Uh, I mean, a second order volition is the default unless it's in competition with, um, other second order desires oh that's the thing like that is like the exact point where i'm not sure what frankfurt like would agree with like which formulation is because i'm not like i can easily conceptualize someone now that has like the second order desire but basically you know not the third you know tier desire um but i don't know if i can conceptualize someone with a second order desire that is not being competed with anything else any other second order desire i've got one but also does not have a second order volition Right. That's like the question I think you asked. Adam. Well, no, I no, really... no. I don't think that was Adam's question. Was it not? No, no. It, it's it's the fact that like it's it's talking about like whether you want like a first order desire to be effective. Right. Like I'm not actually sure how you could 
you know, um, I think I have an example. Okay, you go ahead. So let's, so you have a bunch of, let's use a food example, right? So you have a, a bunch of first order desires to have a bunch of different foods and let's make it really like, let's, let's make it, um, you're only aware of like five different foods. You, you're kind of like, this is like a um, Mary, the color scientist, but with like food, right? So you're only aware of like, you're only aware of, um, five different foods in the world. There's only like five different things you've ever tasted. Right. Sure. And, uh, only one of them is healthy, but, but, uh, and, but likewise, you only, w only one is healthy and only one is good. Ah, but that, but that doesn't make any sense because you wouldn't have, so all of them are good. Oh, but only one of them is healthy, right? So all of them taste good, but only one of them is healthy. Sure. Um, so you have the desire to have all five foods, but you only have the second order desire. You only want to want one of those foods. So there are no other competing second order desires. And so therefore there's no distinction like that defaults to a second order volition because there is no other or there are no other um, second order desires. But the minute that you are introduced to a sixth food and it both tastes good and uh, is good for you, then you have two second order desires. You want to want each of those foods, but you have to have a volition for which one you want to be effective, which one you do actually eat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's how I've been conceptualizing it. Yeah. No, that, I mean, just to be clear, that is also how I conceptualize it. I think it like makes it's intuitive. It makes sense. And I think it's logical uh, and rational, but I, the only thing I'm not sure about is if Frankfurt would like, you know, you know, turn his nose at like one of these. Like, at that? I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I don't I, know. I mean, again, we can't really answer that. I, I really think right here's what I will say that we are just, we are so within the bounds of what's reasonable as an interpretation of this though. Like we just, we have to be like, there's no way that we're outside of the bounds. Um, and, and in re like, I think, so my example was very obviously contrived, but like, um, it was good though. It was good. Yeah. It was very good. Well, yeah, but I was just saying that like, I, I don't know if there's really ever a realistic circumstance wherein we don't have multiple second order desires. Cause like they're kind of always are just competing goods, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, I'll, I'll just read a quote about the wanton. Um, he says, nothing in the concept of a wanton implies that he cannot reason or that he cannot deliberate concerning how to do what he wants to do. What distinguishes the rational wanton from other rational agents is that he is not concerned with the desirability of his desires themselves. So this is like, I, I, I think I'm actually getting his conception of the wanton even more now. Um, cause it's like, he has all of these, it's like a guy who has all of these kind of like second order desires. He like wants to want like a bunch of different food and like whatever, but he's just like, he doesn't even like, it's not that like, this is, this is the Frankfurt kind of like classic line by him. I guess that's running through all of his work is like, it's not that he wants any particular one or, or doesn't want any particular one. It's just that he hasn't even, he's so dumb. He hasn't even considered which one he wants. He's just kind of like, he happens, he finds himself doing one or the other. Right. Like the wanton is so unreflective or non-reflective in this sense. Does that does that make sense? He almost he has no third order desire, basically. So is that it then? The wanton is someone who does not have third order desires. If you're conceptualizing it like we're doing. Um, OK. But I, but again, I think we're just so well within the bounds of doing it. But but I also think that like you don't need the cons like the third order desire to all you have to to, to explain is that this guy is going around never actually endorsing a, a second order of desire. He never has a second order of volition. Um, he's just like, yeah, I want to want all of these things. And, and like, he just kind of, you know, he, like, again, it's like, I mean, it's, well, I'm curious though, because at some, like we have tied all of these ideas about like volition and will to actions themselves. Right. And he is acting in all of these cases. So it's just, it's just well, a little not, bit different. Not all of them are like you can have desires without them being actions. Well, no, my I'm not saying the desire. I'm saying like he acts. Period. One at one point, and then the second point is that like he has second order of desires. So it's like it's weird that he does certain things. Like, is that yeah. not an endorsement? The action itself. No, oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So so I don't think it is. Um, and, and this is like. 
this is kind of the point that I was trying to get at in my like writing sample about the non endorsement or like the non kind of reflectivity about about things. It's like the the wanton would almost be always living in a state of just kind of finding himself doing things. Hmm. It's not like he he's not these kind of competing go- aims. He's he's okay with having both aims and he chooses one. Now it's just like he's kind of like like again, this is hard it's hard to like um it's hard to think about because it's uncomfortable, I guess, to to do so. But like, it's almost hard to distinguish between just like a very poor communicator who does have third order desires, right? Yeah, I, I would, I would like. I think this is harder when you think about like the externalization of it. That's hundred percent true. Yeah, Maybe I, should I think that. I think a lot of this is like. Uh, here's what I think Frankfurt's doing in this paper a lot is is a lot of these things are indistinguishable externally. We can probably make inferences about when someone is acting in certain more wanton ways than others. But I think this is really more of an internal like paper um, by Frankfurt, right? Uh, yeah, I think like, I'm, like Giffen, would you, I mean, it's like if you were looking at like an animal, kind of going back to like animals, and it's just like an animal, you know, wants to go drink some water. Like, d- d- does it want to want to go drink some water? That seems like a higher level that, you know... Yeah, we're... it's like an order. But it yeah, doesn't have a so... second order of volition. Yeah, so... Oh, yeah. I don't even know if it has a second order of desire in that case. I I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I, that's um, the way... I, like, that's the difficult thing is that whenever I think of animals, like, I don't think of second order of desire practically at all. Wouldn't know me either, either, but, like, but whole to be fair, did you actually have that concept before reading this paper? <laughs> Huh? What do you mean? Well, you said like when I think of animals, I don't tend to think of this. But I was saying like, but to be fair, like, did you actually have that concept before reading? Oh, the paper? Yeah. Like, yeah. Do you have second order desires? Like, no, I never. I never thought to myself like, it. It is quite odd that dolphins have the desire, but not the second <laughs> order desire. Like, I have never had that thought. Yeah. To be frank, um, but I'm like, I when I read the paper, you know, before this podcast, I, I, I was thinking to myself like. Like, what is the smartest animal, and does it have? Can I imagine it having a second order of desire? To be fair, though, like think of like a like a very sophisticated ape. Like I, we gotta remember, like dude, we're on a spectrum with it. Like we're not non animals. I know. You know I, I, mean? I was thinking of dolphins, elephants, like you know, chimpanzees. Like I was running through them. Like, I mean, I, like here's the thing that we could we could, like I don't know. There's probably a spectrum. There's probably a spectrum. Like. Do, like you know kind of a chimp does something and he's just scorned for it you know what i mean like does maybe he doesn't want to want that anymore i don't know it's like it it gets a, it gets a little it gets a little you know fuzzy with you it does. Closer it's you totally get to you. an externalization problem as well i i with the, I like, with the chimps because it's clear it's so, it's very clear like the concept of a person is this in like the the third order desire or the the second order volition like whatever you want to like endorse but it's that endorsement it's like it's like i've looked at these and i will endorse one of these second order desires you know and that's the thing that clearly animals don't do or non-humans don't do um but like (laughs) adam the smirk (laughs) what what, what, what? (laughs) I suppose. I mean, I mean, I, I just, I just like earlier on that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Frank Frankfurt either way, like, says that you know, it doesn't actually matter whether animals yeah. do this or not. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter whether, matter whether, like, you know, it's you yeah. know, across several different species. You know, yes, yeah, we're more defining what it means to be a person rather than like species. Just a non-animal. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, it still is useful, I think, because because we can consider. Think... Like, like yeah. think of like think of Frankfurt's wanton. Like there is a very real sense in which that person's kind of subhuman. You know, like you know what I mean, though. Yeah, yeah. right. Frankfurt um, <laughs> uses language that would get him canceled nowadays. I fear. No, I don't think. I don't like because that this person doesn't exist really. I mean, like this person. He did say that. Did he not say that young children would follow onto this and possibly some adults? <laughs> like, well, yeah, but like we don't just, like. No, I don't think he said uh, adults. I don't. I didn't think he said adults fully fall into this. I think he said there are times where we act more wantonly. Than no, others. I think he said there are possibly some adults who are. Wanton. I don't know, man. They're probably yeah, right like, they're probably he, he's like, and the, he, the he, same he said, paragraph he says subhumans too. <laughs> yeah, he said he said uh, verbatim. What did he say? Really? He, said, really? he, he says. Perhaps it also includes some adult human beings as well. <laughs> All right, I, I was trying to save him. I don't know though. Are you guys like? 
maybe, no. maybe, maybe he's right. <laughs> like, yeah, come on, I mean, maybe he's right. Who knows? Like, um, I, certainly some people came to mind, like when, uh, you know, when when reading this. So I, I don't know. If you guys like, I, I gotta be honest. I found this concept just all too applicable for many people. Like, I. The, the old the the i am not at, i am not lacking examples i'm lacking in examples that i can anonymize <laughs> like <laughs> yeah okay honestly like i didn't people didn't come to mind as quickly to me um but like of terms of wanton but I like I per- a low view of people <laughs> wantonly behavior is a little bit easier to conceptualize than wantons I, that, sure. I don't think I know the, a wanton truly. <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, that's, that was like, <laughs> yeah. We're just like I pass by subhumans every day. I know, no, I, 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 I know just like true wantons in my life. But like, yeah, I, I know people that literally don't differentiate between second order desires <laughs> at all. <laughs> Adam, Adam, you do know true one. I, I would have to think about it. I have to think about it. I mean, but I, I can definitely think of people that, like, if I had to, like, bet on it, like, they Dude, definitely, they... they definitely, like, half the time don't differentiate. Oh, so. oh, I would bet. Dude, like, if you give me, if you give me decent odds on whether 51% of the people, 51% of the time are acting wantonly, I would take that bet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, Giffen, like, based on like the way we've just conceptualized it, that, you know, people have, you know, want to want different things, right? I, (laughs) I, I I don't, I don't think people are always operating at like, you know, even close to max capacity. Like, I I mean, I don't think, you know, some people are operating on the third tier there. So... No, I, I don't disagree with the wantonly behavior. I, I was curious if you <laughs> know, wanted. wanted. Like, like I'm, I'm like being serious. Like I was curious if you walk around and you say these people are wantons. Like, you know, dude, I don't once know. in the future wanton just all through their life. I, I gotta be honest. Like, I, I'm kind of starting to think that maybe I do know a few true wantons. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> I like think again, I'm a little less pessimistic. Or, this is this ooh. is an inferential, or uh, yeah, like a, an inferential claim. Can you is that can you say that word like Inferen- infer- inferential? Yeah, if okay. inferential. I'm sorry, I, did I misspeak there? I, uh, I do prefer inferential. Sure. Sorry, if- um, I say inferential. Jesus, I inferential. <laughs> <laughs> you can put that. You gotta get, we gotta, we're, we're talking to a true wanton right now. <laughs> Quite wantonly behavior. I wanted to say both inferential and efferential, <laughs> and I didn't. I didn't have a third order desire. You wanted to. You wanted to want to say both. <laughs> uh, so okay, we should we should get to the actual part that connects with free will about this. Um, so he has this concept of the willing addict, uh, and and the wanton, and he says that the willing addict has a conflicting first order has conflicting first order desires so he wants to take the drug of his choice and he also wants to refrain from taking it and in addition to these first order desires however he has a volition of the second order he is not neutral with regard to the conflict between his desire to take the drug and his desire to refrain from taking it so this is perfect so uh he clearly he has one of those things that he wants to be effective, and that's his uh, uh, volition of the second order. Um, so that's the unwilling addict, where he's like he is taking this drug and he's addicted to it, but he doesn't want that desire to be effective. That's the unwilling addict, and um, the other addict, though he says, is a wanton. So his actions reflect the economy of his first order desires without his being concerned whether the desires that move him to act are desires by which he wants to be moved to act. So this is a person who's just like non-reflectively just addicted and he's neither happy to be addicted nor unhappy. It's just what he does. So he's almost like just to clarify, is it someone who lacks second order desires then? No, like... he, he lacks second order volition. Okay. Yes. Um, Frankfurt's explicit that this person could have second order desires, but not a second order volition. So I, I actually really, I'd like that distinction. Um, and it, he says, whether he is human or not, the wanton 
may, perhaps due to conditioning, both want to take the drug and want to refrain from taking it, so two second-order desires. Unlike the willing addict, however, he does not prefer that one of his conflicting desires should be paramount over the other. He does not prefer that his first-order desire, rather than the other, should constitute his will. So this is exactly, I think, what I was trying to say. Um, so wait, wait can, we, can we go back to... Uh... Where exactly is that? Which page? Oh, I apologize. Uh, Twelve going into thirteen. Okay, because I feel I feel like that was wait that was that was pretty early on, right? Yes. Yeah. Th that was the difference between the unwilling addict and the wanton. It's he's he's again differentiating, uh, just between he, he's trying to give us you know these good kind of nice examples where where uh, uh, flushing out the the concept of the wanton more. Um, so. I guess we should skip ahead. Oh, wait, this was the line that reminded me about um, uh, on Bullshit More. He says, when a person acts, the desire by which he is moved is either the will he wants or a will he wants to be without. When a wanton acts, it is neither. I like that. It, it's the same thing with the, the bullshitter. He, you know, uh, someone either tells the truth or he conforms to the expectation of a lie. But when a bullshitter confabulates, he does neither. Right. It's that it's that same parallel that he's tying in with the wanton. Um, so let's let's skip to the um, let's skip to the free will stuff, because this is that's where it connects with the rest of the series. Um, so he says in section page, three, uh, page, 14, okay. sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> page. <laughs> well, I, I, honestly, you just start going and it's like it's kind of it's, it's much it's much better to be able to read it while you're while you're talking. I apologize. I get a little too uh, emphatic about it. Um, so he says in section three, first line, there is a very close relationship between the capacity for forming second order volitions and another capacity that is essential to persons. It is only because a person has volitions of the second order that he is capable both of enjoying and of lack, lacking freedom of the will. The concept of a person is not only then the concept of a type of entity that has both first order desires and volitions of the second order. It can also be constructed as the concept of an entity for whom the freedom of its will may be a problem. So... This is where he's getting into, um, you know, the free will debate. So last paragraph, he says, having the freedom to do what one wants. Uh, I'm sorry. Having the freedom to do what wants one what. Having the freedom to do what one wants to do is not a sufficient condition for having free will. It is not a necessary condition either. Um, but he says that. Uh, this is next page, uh, 15 second paragraph. When we ask whether a person's will is free, we are not asking whether he is in a position to translate his first order desires into actions. And he says that this is true because there are just, um, there are just kind of, you know, pragmatic, just very low level, like difficulties in doing that sometimes. Like we can be obstructed by things. And that, that's not because it's clear in that case that you could still have, that's not corrupting of a sense of free will. That's corrupting of a sense of, of you being able to sort of um, implement your goals, right? So that, that's not exactly what he's talking about. Um, he says, uh, third paragraph, it seems to me both natural and useful to construe the question of whether a person's will is free in close analogy to the question of whether an agent enjoys freedom of action. Now, uh, freedom of action is roughly at least the freedom to do what one wants to do. Analogously, then, the statement that a person enjoys freedom of the will, also roughly, that he, that he is free to want what he wants to want. Um, it's a little bit, it's like a, a little bit wordy, but um, so this is basically, from what I'm understanding, this is that endorsement of his second order volition or the third order uh, uh, will, or I'm sorry, sorry, the third order desire, not the third order will. Um, so let me read that again. Analogously, then, the statement that a person enjoys freedom of the will means that he is free to want what he wants to want. Um, which, which actually, I mean, it's a little bit wordy at first, but it's making more sense to me. Um, so uh, it makes less sense taken out of, like, the, the tiered orders that we've discussed, especially once he uses the word free. Yes, but, but I think that what he's saying here is that 
like freedom of the will consists in the ability to select which of your second order desires becomes your second order volition, i.e. to have an effective third order desire, right? So he's basically defining free will then as simply the capacity to have a third order desire. I.e. to want to want what you in fact want. Right. (laughs) Yes. Um... I don't know. I, the more we like frame it this way, I, I start to doubt more that he would agree. But it's very like uncertain position I'm taking here because I don't know Frankfurt as well. But to be fair, like, I, what, I, what else would I? I, I, don't, I mean, I this was written in the '70s, so yeah. But I'm not. But he's speaking English. Like, are we really like? What well, What are we doing? That I don't see us really stretching him very much at all. Like, if you're free to want what you want to want i mean let's just walk that backwards so yeah the 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 last want there is the first order desire yes and then the second want you want to want that is this is second. the second order desire yes absolutely so if you're so if you're free to want what you want to want that means you have some sort of control over which second order desire becomes a second order volition that's for sure what what Frankfurt says, and then we're adding the IE, the third level, uh, the third order desire. Yeah, the I, I only really don't think we're stretching him very much. The asterisk that I would introduce is like whether it's simply having the third order desire or being free to choose the third order desire. If that makes sense. Okay, so he might elucidate your question. Um, I have some other quotes from him that might elucidate that. Um, Outside of this paper. No, 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 no. Inside the paper. Um, So skip to page 17. Um, He says, it also satisfies another condition that must be met by any such theory, a theory of free will, by making it apparent why the freedom of the will should be regarded as desirable. The enjoyment of a free will means the satisfaction of a of certain desires, desires of the second or of higher orders, whereas the absence means their frustration. So I think that this is making it clear that he's asking. So he's saying, now this is this is where his true compatibilism comes out. I think. Um, so he's saying that the free will that exists. Um, is the only freedom that we could ever want to have, namely being able to select which second order desire becomes a volition, i.e. what our third order desire is. Um, And so now this is where I begin to disagree with him because up until this point, I found everything he said very... um, these are wonderful distinctions that he's making. They're very important ones. But <clears throat> I think that they are... <clears throat> I don't think that they're a robust conception of true compatibilism. Uh, because the the ability to choose what desire is effective or, or what second order volition is effective, I think, is either one of two things. <clears throat> it's either parasitic parasitic on the contracausal libertarian free will or if it's not it's then corrupted by causal determinism vitiating the sense of could have done otherwise right so so i think that his claim has to collapse into one of two subsequent claims he's either saying that uh this ability to now, which is not to say that, like, I think what he's doing is extremely valuable, but I think it's valuable in evaluating types of persons um, or or types of actions. I don't know that what he's doing is actually talking about free will in the style that, that the rest of the series has been talking about it. Um, I absolutely agree. I kind of read this and it was like, wow, it is quite useful and like probably novel in the 70s to like articulate differences in like yeah. desire tiers like hierarchy of desires mm-hmm. like super cool useful and like you know provokes like you know self reflection and i think it's actually very 
valuable for questions of moral responsibility. Like I actually do think that this is very relevant for questions of moral, moral responsibility, um, but it's not, it's not uh, a satisfying conception of what free will is. I think he introduces distinctions that are hugely relevant for, for moral responsibility, yeah. but, but almost paradoxically not for freedom of the will. But but nonetheless, his distinctions are clearly relevant. Like they're like what I'm saying is is there is clearly a difference between being a wanton or or not. Um, and there's also a difference between being a an unwilling addict or a willing addict or not. Right. right? Yeah. Um, but I just don't think that either of those are actually doing the compatibilism that he thinks they are because. Like I said, you either he either has to be making the claim that there is this agent causal free will that you can choose which second order desire becomes a volition, in which case it seems like he has to be endorsing some sort of libertarianism, right. namely of the agent causal type, mm -hmm. or that uh, ability to determine which of your second order desires is vitiated by determined causal determinism plus randomness in the same way that we've been discussing. Um, I don't know. I kind of view it a little bit differently. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think oh. he does. I think he does kind of free up the will a little bit in the sense that free like, up the will. <laughs> well, no, like I, I, I chose those words deliberately because I think that like by pushing it back a few layers, um, it's not to say that like determinism isn't true, but it's to say that, you know, he, he's kind of like acknowledging the fact that there is, you know, differentiation made by us, although it may be determined. Yeah, but, like, but there is like, you know, the will itself is the product of, you know, uh, you know, second order or effective will, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, is the product of, well, you know, second order volitions, which then could be the product of you know, what, third, uh, third order, order desire. desires, which mm -hmm. honestly reflect, you know, honestly, just how your brain's working, who you are. Yeah. So, totally so yeah, yeah. So I, so I think like in terms of like the actual will, um, I think he does free it up a bit there. And I, I, I actually, and I, I think you guys are maybe a little, you're, you're kind of like adopting Galen a little bit too much, like in kind of viewing this paper. Like, I think like, I, it made a very interesting distinction to me. I thought I it was an interesting distinction too. I think you are maybe misunderstanding me if you think that I would disagree with anything you said there. No, because I think the thing is you're saying that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that he needs to collapse this into one or the other. It needs to either be libertarian, you know, free will, or he just needs to acknowledge causal determinism. But I, I think, but I think like that there is like, he, you know, he could, you know, under like everything mm -hmm. he's just written, still fully acknowledge, acknowledge causal determinism, yeah. but, but free up the will part of it. Well, that I, I, so I would change the way you categorize me just very slightly. I don't think he has to collapse it into either one of those things. But I think if we're searching for, because remember, like, the way I'm viewing moral responsibility is um, there's two le there's two s levels to it, right? There's like a deep sense of moral responsibility, and then there's a shallow sense. Um, if if we're asking, or you know, um, vice versa about free will, right? So like if he's so I'm saying that if you are of a Galen type ilk on this, right? Then then his claim, if you if you're drilling in on his claim, like at the at the end of the day. He either has to be making a claim of agent causal libertarianism that determines the third order desires, right? Or he he would have to admit at the end of the day that like, no, I like how do I determine what's the type of person I want to be? Like, how do I determine what th third order desire I have? The truth is I don't. Like I just have the third order desire I have, and I don't have the ones I don't have. And that like I have no causal role in that. But I'm not saying that his distinctions don't matter um, in their own framework because like they obviously do. Like these are incredibly important distinctions of types of persons and types of actions. Um, but those are in the shallow sense. Uh, once we've, because we, so the way I'm viewing the entirety of this kind of series, like this is my perspective <clears throat> is 
we start off on the roller coaster of like, here's the gold standard contra causal free will, right? And we don't have that because it's incoherent and because there's no reason to believe that we have it. And then we plunge down that roller coaster and we hit the bottom of accepting Galen. There is no deep sense in which anyone is morally responsible for anything. And then P.F. Strassen brings me back up a little bit and he says, well, we can't get on without the concepts of reactive attitudes, i.e. the practices of moral responsibility. And I grant him that. I say, okay. And then we get to the intricate projects of what types of shallow moral responsibility are uh, appropriate and in what circumstances. And that's where I believe that all of these distinctions are very wonderful. Yeah, and I, I, I think I would agree with all that, except for maybe like, <clears throat> and, and it's it's really a semantic point, but honestly, like, <clears throat> like the deep and shallow aspect, I feel like, you know, after reading this paper personally, like the shallow end of the pool just got 20 feet deeper. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like it, it did, because it's like, I mean, like, okay, so like if, if, if I frame something like this, like, um, you know, I don't know, say, Giffen, I'm going to choose you, all right? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't I'm expect so, anything less. I'm sorry, Giffen. No, okay, but, but like, <laughs> say I like, wronged you in such a way and i wanted to do it right you already have <laughs> <laughs> but then yeah. in fact in fact i really wanted to want it to, to, to wrong you he wanted you know that to I be mean? his effective desire yeah okay yeah and and like it goes like a few layers deep that like yeah. you know like i was actually like endorsing this behavior yeah i i think there is like you know in a real sense i'm not responsible for who i am but I, I am pretty bad though. You know what I mean? Like, like yes. I, 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 in a way, like, you know, I, I am a pretty bad character and, you know, so I'm do you not... think Jordan and I would disagree there? Wait, can I clarify? No, sure. no, but I, I wouldn't have thought about it in those terms necessarily before reading this paper. Okay. And I think, and I think that, that, um, it, it doesn't say anything about the ultimate nature of moral responsibility. Yeah. But I think it adds like a few layers to you know how what? you go ahead. In your example, the way I would phrase how I view it is it doesn't make the shallow end deeper. It makes it uh, wider, it gives you more area to swim in it. Um, because I think the depth of the pool is determined or vitiated by the sense of could have done otherwise. Like that's what it hinges on for me. Um, Can I add another layer to this um, analogy? Well, I w yeah. I, wait, w w hold on, hold on. What was Adam? I wasn't finished, but what were you going to say, Adam? I was going to say, I mean, he seems like he wrote a paper on that, right? Like he read like one of the possibilities. Like, in one of the footnotes here, he said, like, I, I respond to, let me see here. It's probably his possible, possible alternate possibilities. Or, I can't remember the name of the paper. Let's see if we can find that exact quote, though. Okay, it's at the uh, bottom of 19. He said, for another discussion of the considerations mm -hmm. that cast doubt on the principle that a person is morally responsible for what he has done only if he could have done otherwise, see my alternate possibilities of moral responsibility. Yeah, I kind of I I I I want to read that. Like, I that see was what... the paper I referenced at the beginning, yeah. We, we should definitely read This is the 69 paper, the one that I said was right before this one. Yeah, I, I'm I'm interested to see what his take is because I think everything you said so far has been pretty interesting. So, I agree. I agree. So I want to I want to read more about this guy. Yes, we definitely should. Um, but like, do you? So I, I was just trying to make sure that I was being clear about how I was viewing this, though. Um, I got I so so what I was saying is like I think that all of his conceptions are really excellent in sort of um, the area of the shallow pond, uh, the, the sh <laughs> Peter Singer's shallow pond, um, the shallow end of the pool. But I don't think it makes it any deeper because for me, the depth of the pool is based on the sense of could have done otherwise. Now, maybe his paper will change my mind about that, the alternative possibilities. Um, but uh, what I was saying, though, is that uh, the the area of the shallow part consists in the richness in which we might evaluate persons or characters, right? So this adds a ton of surface area in how we can evaluate 
kind of the the constitution of persons or their character i don't know though i mean like it's like like okay so imagine this well let me get off this point real fast you're so sorry giffen no no problem but like (laughs) would you like differentiate between like you know the moral responsibility of a wanton versus like you know someone who actually endorses second order volitions like like you know like 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 you know like yeah. say like you so like that's that's kind of like i think a good point though to bring up is that you know if, if he's like i think if he's like differentiating between like you know different degrees of moral responsibility i wonder if it's like a deeper sense that he's pointing to it. like you know if somebody is you know kind of moving through you know different levels of desires and is endorsing them you yeah. know regarding like you know the you know, however in which, however which way they've wronged you, versus someone that just simply acts on first order desires. I got it. Like I, got it, yeah. I, I, I kind of hold somebody like you know more morally responsible, you know, in okay. a deeper sense because I, like yeah, I get what you're saying. The, I, I the got, pull of the illusion is stronger in one of those senses than the other, in way a way stronger. that yeah. in a way that calling it an illusion is a bit pays injustice to. I, I think so. I think so. I understand that view. Um, I differ from it slightly because um, it's like, oh, sorry, Giffen. <laughs> I, I differ. From, I differ from it slightly because uh, is the wanton on on a playing field uh, with the willing addict or the unwilling addict? I should say, sorry, um, more or less morally responsible. In one sense, no. Like they're, they're they're neither of them are morally responsible in any way, in a deep sense. Um, but the problem is, is that I think the way that they are, they might be more and less morally responsible in the shallow sense is cashed out by something that Frankfurt wouldn't endorse. For me, that would be consequences, right? Like, can, can this person be like reintegrated into society? Is this person a danger to themselves and others? Like, does this person have to be dealt with? Um, and it kind of comes down to, it comes down to more, uh, I guess, kind of like, you know, maybe like, calculating or cold consequentialist reasons for it um but but i fully admit that like as per pf strassen like the reactive attitudes are the default for especially for interpersonal life and those can be modified so insofar as i'm admitting there's different depths to the shallow part of the pool i think i would be saying that the reactive attitudes can be modified a bit um, by, by like whether we're conceptualizing someone as kind of a wanton or a willing addict or an unwilling addict, right? Like th- th- those are, but, but I'm viewing those as rather shallow differentiations, uh, when, when the, the floor of the pool can be so deep. Does that, while admitting that all of those differences are very important and that's, uh, sorry, that's all I'll say to Giffen. <laughs> May I? You, you go ahead, Giffen. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to phrase it. Once you brought up the pool analogy, something immediately came to my mind, and this might be, I don't know, more or less useful. But to me, it's like I agree with Jordan that the pool didn't get deeper, like the shallow end didn't get deeper. To me, it was like the idea of using second, like the tiered desires, um, is useful in a like moral responsibility sense to me, um, in a way that makes the gradations finer in the shallow end like before like i probably like without the tool i would have like you know been using like you know course adjustments but like with the the idea of like this second and third order desires and like i think that adds like a lot of fine details to the kind of discussion that's all i wanted to say because basically the way i'm viewing all of these compatibilist accounts um there's actually another one that we could read it's by dana nelkin um she endorses from what i understand like a certain type of reasons responsiveness view, which is interesting. Um, but the way that I'm viewing kind of all of these different different types of uh, of compatibilism is they are all extremely valuable and extremely useful, but not in the way, not exactly in the way that they present themselves as being. Um, it, it's all sort of like I, I just see the, 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 the like more responsibility really is just dealt a death blow, I think, by Galen Strassen and Dirk Paraboom. Um, like I just buy their arguments 100 percent. But then when I do also admit that like P.F. Strassen's right, that reactive attitudes are what constitute interpersonal life, 
uh, then I'm forced to like evaluate when we, <laughs> it's almost funny, like when we act as if people had moral responsibility. I don't like that way of phrasing it. Um, but it's like, I don't like the way of phrasing it at all, actually. I don't know why I said it. Um, but so these compatibilist accounts give us wonderful, it turns a piece of bread into an English muffin, right? Like there's all of these kind of different uh, ways of evaluating people's character and kind of looking at people um, as persons or not. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. These, like that's That's how I'm viewing it. To me, those were like the greater like finer gradations that i was referring to is like with more tools you have like more complexity and more nuance in the evaluation but there is still like you never get to the deep end of the pool like there's no in deep sense like moral responsibility there's no, there's no ultimate moral responsibility for sure um but it's like but 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 that's not the end like this is where i would disagree with galen's trust like that's not the end of the project do you know what i mean like it's it's that roller. It's like, it's like, okay, there's no libertarian. So there's, so it's completely incoherent, like in a deep sense, but like P.S. Strassen's right. Like we do have to have reactive attitudes. And then I disagree with Strassen where like, no, I think they can be refined in a way. And the way that I think they can be refined is in these compatibilist ways, these differentiations that they bring out. But I, but I don't agree with the compatibilists that like, if these certain conditions are met, then there's moral responsibility warranted from there. I'm using their distinctions uh, in a more piecemeal way than that. And it's grounded, I think my current view is that the, all of those are grounded by consequentialist concerns of, of blame and punishment. So, you know, deterrence, containment, rehabilitation, um, concerns like that. So I'm like, I'm just kind of a weird clusterfuck right now, honestly, of a bunch of different philosophers and their views. But I, I think that I have rather well-formed reasons for what I believe. Obviously, it's open to change. But like, this is where I'm currently at, having read all of this stuff. Yeah. Jordan, I feel like we're on the same page here. I'm not sure to what extent Adam would agree. Yeah, I don't know. Well, like, I, I wanted to at least disagree. No, agree. Oh, I was like, he, he definitely doesn't disagree. No, no I, I, I think he's like, you know, nearly to where I think we're both at. I'm just Adam, not 100% sure. Yeah, I was just curious. I wanted to spell that out fully, Adam, for you so you could see if, if there was any area of disagreement. Um, it, it's not that I disagree in any like meaningful sense. It's just that I think, I don't know, this paper had a pretty strong impact on my view of like moral responsibility. So whether we want to say it didn't deepen the pool, it widened the pool, it gradations, it made the, you know, the bread yeah. a muffin. I mean, I, I, <laughs> how, however, like, you know, in terms yeah. of like verbiage, we may disagree. Like, I, I think like, you know, yeah. generally we're on the same page. So. Yeah. Cause, cause like I, I like, there's one line by him on page 19 that I like, he says, suppose that when a person has done what he wanted to do, that he did it because he wanted to do it. And that, the will by which he was moved when he did it was his will because it was the will he wanted. Then he did it freely and of his own free will. Like, I think that's perfect. Like, I love that conceptual conceptualization, but it's only pragmatically that he did it. Like, it's not a deep sense. It's a shallow sense in which he did it of his own free will. Um, because there is like a, dis there's a distinction in my mind between being locally compelled to do something, uh, versus ultimately compelled to do something like, the thing I take away from the Galen paper is that everything is basically a special case of, of compulsion, right? Like we're all forced to do exactly what we do and nothing else. And it's not, we don't have any control over that. That being said, there's a difference between you holding me at gunpoint to sign a document and me willingly sign the document. Those are all just pragmatic differences um, to me though. And those I think are just, where I find this compatibilist literature so useful. And also just like, I, I feel like it's like when examining, just like when someone, you know, doesn't meet the basic demand, you know, that PF Strassen kind of lays out. Like, I think that um, there's like a greater violation of the basic demand, um, you know, someone operating, you know, 
you know, kind of differentiating between second order desires if someone wrongs you. Like, I feel like oh, I, yeah. I, I, I feel like I like that basic demand that I have has been violated, you know, um, just yeah. in a greater sense than some uh, than, than someone acting wantonly. So a Cornell psychologist, social psychologist has actually done some interesting work on this. Um, David Pizarro. He, uh, I, I, I don't know which study it was of his, um, might have even been part of his thesis. I, I, I don't remember. Um, but he did work showing that, um, I'm going to get the butcher the details of this, but like he did empirical work showing that people alter the blame that they cast on people based on whether they think that their second order desire aligned with the first order desire. So like, for instance, and it makes, and it makes total sense. Like if you, uh, it, they gave they gave people an example of like I, I don't know the details of how they presented this so as to be you know statistically scrupulous but um, there was an example where like uh, someone in a bar like punches another person and it was like you know it was it, it, they, for, I don't know how they did it but they made it clear that it was very reactive very impulsive and people blamed him less uh, than someone who went to the bar planning to punch that person and then punch them. And it's because they reason people implicitly assume that the person's in the first case, their second order desire uh, conflicts with the first. And in the second, the, they align and it's their second order volition. Uh, that sounds so like an excellent read. Yeah. Well, he did it. Uh, he, I remember I mean, he used this paper explicitly to design that uh, social psych study, which was very cool. Um, so this was a pretty good paper. This was very good. Oh, a this, wonderful this, paper. This Frankfurt yeah. paper, yeah. 100% yeah. agree. I'm glad. Remarkable. Uh, it's from 71. Well, this was uh, the P.F. Strauss. So the, the P.F. Strauss and paper and this paper and there, there was a there was a huge explosion of uh, work in this area in the 60s and 70s. Mm. Um, and from what I understand, it died down. A little bit. What are you laughing at? <laughs> you just think of absurd things again. No, no. It's just Giffen. Oh. <laughs> Giffen, <laughs> Giffen clearly has a very lowly opinion. It's like the third time he's commented. Like, yeah, from, and, people and, in the seventies. Yeah. Like, they must have been Neanderthals. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I don't. I don't really get. I I'm guess. I'm not amazed like, that this came out of the seventies. Like, I don't share yeah. the situation. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I just Giffen keeps remarking. Like, I can't believe it was the seventies. <laughs> they, they actually had such novel ideas. It's like, yeah. I, mean, I thought surprised. they were still fighting with sticks back then. <laughs> Dude, we this had the, remarkable. We had like. I don't know, we, the space, like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just think I, 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 I was remarking about how, like, I blew, I blew past know. that the first two times. <laughs> I, just, I, was, I, like, I guess it's not surprising that it was written in the 70s, but like, <laughs> you're right, he said it three times. <laughs> well, I, I, I was just like, you know, the first two times, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I guess the third time, like, <laughs> No, I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm like, people were thinking about pretty, pretty interesting things in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> like, I mean, what's the, uh, the oldest, like, the oldest philosophy paper was the 33, 34 paper by Bertrand Russell. Um, uh, um, in defense the, of idleness? Yeah, in defense of idleness. Yeah, that was yeah. from like the 30s. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't believe he could read and write back then. <laughs> That's exactly what my claim was. <laughs> honestly, honestly, the first thing that came to mind when you ever made that remark was I was just like, you, you thought the, the 70s was composed of a bunch of wantons, you know? <laughs> How can I know? Uh, all right, I think I think we're good to wrap it up with this. Um, I liked it. I liked it. <laughs> <end on. laughs> yeah, surprised that anyone had a coherent thought in the 70s. <laughs> That is the summation of my belief on this paper. But I, I was just gonna, like I was saying before we got on the tangent, that yeah, there was like an explosion of this literature in the '60s and '70s, um, and it's, it's, I think it's reemerged in the late, the late 2000s, uh, as, as another blow up. So, um, yes, okay. Well, I don't know what paper we're gonna do next, but, uh, but hopefully you're still enjoying the series, and, uh, and we'll tune in next time for it. <laughs>